and welcome to Christchurch Peter Maritzburg's Church Online. We are so glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Lord. We are really blessed to know that you are amongst us as Christchurch family. Uh, even though we can't see each other, greet each other, or smile to each other, we know that your spirit is present during today's service. Lord, we ask you to bless this different togetherness and to open our hearts and minds to the message we are about to hear. Dear Lord, we pray for your closeness and comfort for those who are battling with ill health and loneliness. Will you be their companion, please? Heavenly Father, there are so many hungry and destitute people. Please instill the willingness in us, for those who can, to assist in whatever form. We pray that you will continue to bless Christchurch Peter Marisburg and its leadership. Lord, we know we live in difficult times and that there are so many hardships. We also know about financial hardships and that Christchurch is not spared. Let us not forget that our contribution in whatever form will make a difference and will enable us to continue to spread the gospel to many people, including ourselves. Lord, we ask you to bless all the leaders in South Africa with wisdom, compassion and respect. Please send your godly messengers to them to guide them. Lastly, we again ask your blessing on the service. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Good morning everyone, I'm Liz Robertson reporting on the Compassion Meals Ministry. Towards the end of 2019, I expressed to Wayne the burden placed on my heart for the need of meals for our church families who had been hospitalised and either they or their family needed a meal or meals given to them. Wayne was happy for me to go ahead and set up this ministry. I approached some of our CCPMB congregate and asked if they would be willing to create a stock of ready-made meals per month for the freezer at the back of the church, and they expressed a willingness to make two or three meals per month. This would mean that there would be meals available at short notice to give to those as and when required. This worked well until the COVID pandemic hit us, and I realised that a more structured ministry was needed. This resulted in creating a WhatsApp group, and it was absolutely amazing when this was set up, how more and more ladies put their names forward, wanting to be included to prepare or give meals. This lessened the load for the original team, and a roster was made for each week for meals and or the deliveries to each home. It was so heartwarming as well to have two of our men folk volunteering to cook and deliver meals. I want to thank each and every one of you who have contributed to this ministry by making meals, delivering, giving suggestions or supporting each other along the way through prayer. It has really been so wonderful to see God so beautifully at work and I give him all praise and glory and gratitude. Thanks. Well, Chris, thanks uh, so much for, for, for coming here this morning. It's, it's great to see you. And before anything else, I want to say a huge thank you to the Missions Committee at Christchurch. You've been wonderful to me and the ministry. I want to tell you I'm incredibly grateful for your prayers, your love and your financial giving every month. Thank you. 
Now, those of you who know me will know that the greatest driving force in my life is to train pastors and missionaries for Africa. The church is growing quicker in Africa than anywhere in the world, but between 70 and 75% of the pastors have had no training whatsoever. So we create an opportunity for that. So Chris asked me, what did I do in lockdown? Hey, my friends, it's been a massive blessing to our work, believe it or not. Let me show you just a few things. The first thing that we've done is we've taken our whole distance learning correspondence course, which some of you have got, and it has now been translated into Swahili and printed. So now we can distribute it across the whole of East Africa, free of charge, and to enable the students to listen to the lectures. They listen on this little cell phone with some of you by, and then they follow it in the notes. That has been huge. The second thing is through uh, my wonderful secretary, Charmaine and uh, Margaret, they've been typing themselves frantic. And um, we have now sending out a COVID newsletter every month. So uh, number six will be going out soon. And I've also just printed the four sentinel points in my life, which has generated a lot of interest. And then we've taken all of these journals that some of you read, and they've been printed and collated into two books, which uh, folks have wanted to read. So it's been very busy. But the, the great joy for me is that over 40 odd years, all my sermons and Bible studies have now been put onto our website so that our students and friends all over the world and Africa can now go into the website and uh, they can get whatever they need on, uh, on anything else that they want by way. Bible study, sermon outlines, lectures, anything, how to do mission work, how to do children's work, it's all on the website. So with the two ladies typing their hearts out, with Herod down in Cape Town, the website has been redone, revitalized, and is of great, great help to our people. So the lockdown, with all the sadness in the country and all the corruption, it's given me an opportunity to refocus. We've also uh, been open at KMBC since July, and by doing 30-odd lectures a week, I've been able to now catch up for second and third term. So we will end on the 17th of this month, fully up to date, ready to train pastors and missionaries for Africa. It's been great. Now, friends, I've got 30 seconds left. God bless you all. Eh? Thank you so much for supporting us. And uh, just pray that we'll be able to get back into Africa. I'm missing it very, very much. Chris, thank you. Today's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 32. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, 
and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave the gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, and he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last cent. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. This is the word of God. The oath of allegiance is something that's made to the ruling monarch. In the United Kingdom, it's a promise to be loyal to the British monarch and his or her heirs and successors, sworn by certain public servants in the United Kingdom, and also by newly naturalized subjects in citizenship ceremonies. The current standard wording is set out in the Promissory Oaths Act 1868. I, John Citizen, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. However, it's an unmatched privilege to belong to the greatest king of all time, His Majesty King Jesus, and swear allegiance to Him. For once you belong to Him, you then live under His rule. Jesus started his teaching in Matthew chapter 5, stating how this is to be expressed in our lifestyle. He identified who we are. These are the nine blessed beatitudes describing what his followers are characterized by. And Jesus then also goes on to explain what we are to do as his followers. He states our mission. This is to be salt and light in a decaying and darkened world in which we live. Jesus then explains what it means to live under his rule. It's not just a simplistic matter of keeping a set of rules legalistically. Do this, don't do that. It's not that easy. And it's certainly not achievable either. Jesus' teaching is radical. He calls his followers to a life of total submission, reflected in complete obedience, not just keeping the letter of the law. Jesus' arrival as king of the kingdom sees him ushering in his kingdom and establishing the new community who now belong to God. He will reign over them as their king, and there couldn't be a greater king to have rule over you than King Jesus. Now open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Firstly, Jesus fulfills the law, verses 17 and 18. Jesus clarifies his relationship to the law. The law is shorthand for the Old Testament scriptures. Notice two things. Firstly, the scriptures pointed to Jesus. Jesus makes the claim that the law pointed to him. His arrival on earth was predicted, and now he has come. He is claiming to be the long-expected Messiah. Listen to verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Verses 17 and 18. And secondly, Jesus obeyed the scriptures. Jesus hasn't come to relax the requirements of the law, nor has he come to abolish the law either. Rather, 
he has come to fulfill it. He lived the perfect life in absolute obedience to God his Father. And tragically, this is something that all of us have dismally failed to do. Not one of us can ever claim to have kept the law of God. Instead, we're all branded as lawbreakers. Yet he showed that in living in total obedience to God by the Spirit, that a life of total obedience is possible, just as God intended. Remember this conversation Jesus had with an expert in the Scriptures, recorded for us in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. In other words, according to Jesus, perfect obedience to the law of God will result in gaining eternal life. But this is simply impossible. You cannot, by keeping the law, enter his kingdom because you can't keep the law perfectly. We all fall short. Some fall far shorter than others, but nevertheless short. For we all fall short. So, this then means that you can't self-qualify for entry into God's kingdom. The only way to enter the kingdom is to trust in Jesus, who fulfilled the law perfectly. You're totally dependent on Jesus to undeservingly give you access into his kingdom, granting you acceptance with God. This is called grace. For if it wasn't for God's grace, then none of us would ever be admitted to God's kingdom. You experienced God's grace? If not, then drop me a line in our email address and I'd love to help you. I am reminded, though, of the Sovereign Grace song we sometimes sing, Grace Unmeasured, Vast and Free, with these words. Grace amazing, pure and deep, that saw me in my misery, that took my curse and owned my blame, so I could bear your righteous name. Grace paid for my sins and brought me to life. You see, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law, the scriptures, when no one else could. That leads me to the second thing. Jesus demands obedience. Verses 19 through 32. Jesus asserts his authority as king. He demands loyalty from all who follow him. He demands obedience to his words too. Jesus ended his teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, saying, When he had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Obedience shows you truly belong to Jesus. It's the distinctive mark of his followers. Listen to verse 19. Therefore, who ever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So greatness in God's kingdom is measured by the extent to which you adhere to his commandments. This reshapes how followers of Jesus are to aspire to greatness. The more you obey God's commands, the greater you are. Go for it. Towards the end of chapter 7, Jesus makes his radical demands known. The wise person hears and obeys. Now picture the scene. A child is disciplined by a teacher in the school classroom. The teacher instructs the child to sit down. But the child refuses to comply with this reasonable instruction. He shows defiance. Then realizing that he isn't winning the battle, the child sits down in protest. But his words to the teacher are quite revealing. I'm sitting down in the outside, but in the inside, I'm standing up. There is an outward adherence to the requirements of the law. That's evident. However, while these requirements are being kept, in reality, they're being disobeyed. It's for this very reason 
that Jesus challenges his hearers in verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Obedience must come from the heart, like a child with a desire to please their father. It's not a mere outward conformity, but rather a genuine inward obedience. And this display of obedience isn't merely aimed at trying to earn God's favor either. That's out of the question. Even our absolute best efforts fall far short. So King Jesus requires an obedience that surpasses or exceeds what's just law-keeping. A mere legalistic outward adherence to the laws. Jesus then strikingly intensifies the demands of the law. He defines obedience by a far stricter criterion. The kind of checklist or tick box type of compliance isn't acceptable. In fact, it's never been acceptable in God's sight. Just think of it like this. Think of a show jumper with her horse. Instead of the obstacle set on the lowest standard, they set on their maximum to separate true champions from just mere competitors. This is precisely what Jesus does. He raises the standard to what it ought to be, not just a minimal compliance standard. Now, Jesus cites examples of what life of those who've been admitted to his kingdom ought to look like. He contrasts the set standards of the day, and then he intensifies these demands, showing all his followers that there isn't to be a minimalistic requirement mindset to obedience, but rather a far more comprehensive understanding that defines how his followers are to live life. He uses six examples. We'll deal with the first three this week, the next three next week. In order to make his point, Jesus uses a repeated phrase. You have heard that it was said, referring to what's considered an acceptable standard, contrasting it with, but I tell you, stating his kingly authority to intensify the demand. This is God's perfect standard. Now, on the issue of murder, verse 21. You've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the fire of hell. Jesus calls for a life of total obedience. The Ten Commandments are clearly in view. You shall not murder. But Jesus raises the intensity. It's the law on steroids to reflect God's perfect requirements. You don't even have to draw blood to commit murder, according to Jesus. You simply need to speak words in anger, and you've committed the offense. This raises the stakes in obedience. Anyone not guilty? So don't even get angry with one another, for this will surely incur God's judgment. And then Jesus offers a practical insight to its outworking. Listen to verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. Jesus upholds a high view of relationships. Now would be a good time to assess your relationships with one another. If there's any disharmony, fix it without delay. The second issue Jesus raises is adultery. Verse 27. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That lustful look with the desire in your heart for an illicit relationship with a woman other than your wife is adultery. Women are also guilty of lust. 
according to Jesus, you don't have to do it physically. It's just that lustful look, and you're guilty of adultery. This should shape how we relate to one another. Jesus is a high view of purity. God calls you to live a life of purity. Have you got eyes for someone else's wife or husband? And if you are single or divorced, are you looking lustfully at somebody else? Or are you fantasizing about sexual conquests or secretly viewing pornography? Let's ask God to set a guard over our eyes and hearts. Let's ask God to give us a pure heart. And again, Jesus offers a radical, practical solution to its outworking. Listen to verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. He isn't asking you to literally pluck out your eye or cut off your hand, because even if you do, you can still fantasize in your imagination and heart. But Jesus is offering a radical solution of obedience to God what you should most prize, your salvation. And thirdly, the issue of divorce. Marriage relationships are shattered in divorce. Sadly, the statistics show little difference between Christians and those who aren't. This is a tragic indictment on followers of Jesus. Jesus places a very high view on marriage. He doesn't want marriages to end in divorce. Listen to verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Once again, Jesus is intensifying God's requirements. He isn't in favor of marriages dissolving in divorce. The acceptable custom was that divorce simply required a certificate, presumably entitling the legally divorced person to be eligible to be able to get remarried. Jesus confronts the permissiveness of the standards in marriage. Jesus appears to be confronting the case where a spouse divorces their marriage partner because a more likable suitor has been found. This helps clarify Jesus' conclusion, saying that divorcing to get remarried is adultery. Jesus is intensifying the requirements for lifelong faithfulness in marriage till death parts you. How faithful are you to your marriage partner? Do you fix the relational strains and stresses quickly so as not to put your marriage at risk? When your marriage isn't all it's cracked up to be, do you look over the fence for a replacement? You can keep the letter of the law, but defy the spirit of the law. Now this doesn't mean that divorce is unpardonable. But Jesus concedes that a marriage is compromised by a third party. But even then, it's not necessary that divorce is the only solution. Surely reconciliation is the highest goal. Maybe you're divorced. Jesus states that it's the result of the hardness of heart. Yet Jesus upholds a high view of marriage, something our contemporary world is undermining and trashing. Let's pray for Christian marriages, for husband and wife to be faithful to one another till death parts them. Yet, if you are divorced, may you know God's pardoning grace. The bottom line is this. In all aspects of life, we must live in total obedience to Jesus. Be careful that the sinful desires of your heart don't lead you astray. You don't even need to do the act to be guilty of having committed the offense. So act lovingly towards everyone. Don't allow anger to be stirred up in your heart. And be faithful in marriage to your husband or wife. Don't have wandering, lust-filled eyes. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Don't look for other alternatives when your husband or wife no longer pleases you. Finally, don't just keep the demands of the law outwardly, but rather with a purity of heart and absolute devotion to Jesus. Live in obedience. 
the life Jesus calls you to live as a follower is a life marked by total obedience. Well, let's wrap it up. Let's commit to swear allegiance to King Jesus as those who follow him. I, Wayne Kevin Barkazen, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his majesty, King Jesus, according to God's law, so help me God. Will you also make this promise? Let's not take the easiest, superficial option, making a show of keeping the rules and a pretense of loyalty. Rather, let's seek to, by God's empowering grace through his spirit, to live a life of total obedience to King Jesus. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that Jesus fulfilled the law of God by living in total obedience. Help me to aspire to live in obedience to God's ways in all areas of my life as a follower of Jesus. Strengthen me to not just outwardly adhere to your law, but do it with all my heart in purity of life. Amen.